and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this time, um, we have one of my favorite Red Hatters, James Faulkner, um, from the Red Hat Middleware team coming. He's going to talk to us about building cloud-native applications using some of the ROAR uh, work that's being done at Red Hat and um, Wildfly Swarm. So um, I'm going to let uh, James uh, introduce himself. The format of this event is uh, that we do the Q&A in chat um, and there's a live demo. And at the end of this whole session, um, when he finally takes a breath, um, we will have live Q&A. So James, I'm going to let you take it away. I know there's a lot of content and I'm really looking forward to this one. Okay, great. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so hello, everyone. As Diane mentioned, my name is James Faulkner. I am a technical marketing manager in the Red Hat Middleware Group. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about building cloud-native applications with Wildfly Swarm and Roar. Uh, I'll give you a brief intro to Roar and Wildfly Swarm, uh, but the most of the time we'll spend doing a hands-on demo so you can get a feel of what this is, what we're actually talking about here. So I won't spend too much time on the, uh, on the marketing fluff at the beginning. Uh, just briefly, uh, a couple of, of other uh, OpenShift Commons briefings that have occurred uh, late last year around Roar and building cloud-native apps with Spring Boot. Uh, you can see the listing here. Uh, we also did one for a, a mon monolith to microservices journey describing how you can um, modernize your existing applications using Roar. So uh, check those out if you're interested in more in-depth detail around um, modernization, or if you're interested in Spring Boot or uh, Roar in general. So I, I, again, I will give a brief introduction to Roar. So Roar stands for Red Hat OpenShift Application Runtimes. And what this is, is a new product from Red Hat. It's a collection of curated and uh, certified and, uh, and supported runtimes and frameworks that are targeting um, microservice and kind of cloud native application development for companies who either have existing applications that they want to modernize or they're building net new applications, cloud native uh, applications, you can use the components within Roar to do that. So uh, here's a, a market architecture diagram of what, it, what Roar actually contains. So at the top, you see a, a tested and verified frameworks. These are popular frameworks that have uh, been proven to be very useful and, uh, and effective in building cloud native applications like Spring Boot. Uh, there's a number of, of open source projects from Netflix uh, around um, fault tolerance and other aspects of microservice development. Um, and then underneath, we have the supported microservice runtimes, which include uh, JBoss EAP, which is, uh, we've had for a number of years. Uh, we've also added in other popular runtimes like uh, Eclipse Vertex for building reactive applications. Um, we have Node.js for building uh, uh, reactive JavaScript applications. And we also have embedded Tomcat uh, for building uh, more lightweight web applications. And then lastly, we have uh, Wildfly Swarm, uh, which uh, we'll get to in a moment. Uh, so all of these applications are packaged into a product from Red Hat and supported through our, our normal uh, support channels. We also have a, a um, launch experience, which I'll get to in a moment. But getting down to the nuts and bolts, so uh, when we talk about these frameworks, how are they actually delivered to you as a customer or as an open source developer? Uh, well, three of them at least are kind of Java based. And so you typically use things like Maven or Gradle. So uh, we at Red Hat focus on Maven. So uh, we have artifacts in Maven repositories, which deliver these components to you uh, for uh, non-Java, like uh, Node.js in, in this case, it's delivered as a, a, a container on our uh, Red Hat container catalog. So we have um, official supported um, channels for getting the bits into your projects. And you'll see this in the demo as well. So I also mentioned the launch experience. So before you get deep down into, into building cloud native apps with Roar and you want to see what Roar is all about, if you head over to developers.redhat.com slash launch, uh, we have a kind of a guided wizard-like experience for generating new projects. Uh, and these projects uh, exemplify cloud native uh, aspects like um, fault tolerance with uh, circuit breaking and externalized configuration and uh, securing, uh, well, uh, securing microservices and so forth. So we call these things boosters. And so this launch site will walk you through and allow you to select the type of, of what we call a mission that you want to uh, um, see an example of. You can also select which runtime you want, whether it's Spring Boot or Vertex or Swarm or Node.js. 
Uh, you can deploy it to your local OpenShift instance, um, or you can deploy it to OpenShift online as well. So uh, check that out if you want to get started without, without too much fuss and, and without having to uh, download and install too many things. OK, so let's focus on Wildfly Swarm. So Swarm is one of the runtimes in Roar. Um, Wildfly Swarm uh, targets uh, Java microservices. Um, it has a, a lineage uh, going back, as you, can, uh, as you can guess from the name, goes back to the upstream Wildfly project. And this is an open source Java EE application server. Wildfly Swarm brings in a number of components from Wildfly itself to, uh, to implement a number of features that uh, microservice developers need. Also, uh, more importantly, it brings in Java EE features so that if you are a Java EE developer and you're looking to uh, implement microservices, Wildfly Swarm is a great uh, choice because it, you can leverage that existing expertise that you already have. Again, it brings in components from Wildfly, but it also brings in components outside of the Wildfly ecosystem for doing a number of things, like which we'll see in the demo in a moment. Um, it also is an implementation of MicroProfile, which is a new uh, specification championed by a number of companies, and we'll have some more detail on that in a moment. Uh, so getting down into the nuts and bolts of Wildfly Swarm, so what it is is a way to package just enough of the app server uh, components needed to run your application. So these uh, components are packaged into what we call fractions. So these are these are things that provide the a small amount of functionality that you need. And so the way you build your application is you declare the fractions that you need, or you let Wildfly Swarm auto detect what you need based on your source code, and then it packages into a single runnable jar file, which we call a fat jar or Uber jar. Um, so you can you can again you can add the specific fractions that you need and uh, only only package those things that you need. So it makes it a very small runtime, uh, easily deployable to uh, um, a container application or container orchestration platform like OpenShift, for example. Each of the fractions is also uh, configurable independently. So each fraction may expose some configuration uh, knobs that you can turn to modify things. So uh, for tooling, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we focus on Maven in the Wildfly Swarm project. There's also a Gradle plugin, uh, but uh, you'll see the Maven stuff coming uh, in this demo. And so uh, we have a plugin for Maven uh, called the Wildfly Swarm plugin, uh, which is one aspect of the tooling. We also have IDE integration. So with JBoss Forge, which is a scaffolding project that um, in your IDE, you can cl click a few buttons and it generates a bunch of scaffolded code for you. Uh, in the Swarm case, it will also do the same. It will it'll generate a project for you or it will, it will uh, uh, annotate your existing project with Wildfly Swarm functionality and get you up and running very quickly. There's also a Swarm tool, which lets you wrap an existing WAR file. If you have an existing application and you can't rebuild it for whatever reason, you can wrap it into a runnable jar file using Swarm tool. And then lastly, there's a project generator very similar to what you get in the Spring ecosystem with start.spring.io. Uh, if you head over to wildfly-swarm.io slash generator, you can choose your dependencies and click a button and it'll generate a project for you, which you can download and then uh, you're off on your way to uh, building awesome stuff with Wildfly Swarm. So we won't use the generator today, but we will use Maven plugin and the JBoss Forge add-on. Uh, here's a just a quick screenshot of the project generator. As you can imagine, you just type in some uh, identifiers, you choose from an auto-completed list of dependencies, and then you click download and, you, and you're off and running or click generate project and you're off and running. Uh, for cl building cloud native applications with Swarm in particular, there's a number of features within Swarm that come from either the Java EE upstream Wildfly project or from other projects like Netflix to implement features that target specific for around cloud native. And the uh, definition of cloud native is somewhat uh, uh, ambiguous, but essentially there's a number of, of aspects of a project that make it cloud native and make it a, a, able to be deployed to a cloud environment with uh, uh, you know, changing network conditions and different environments through uh, from the developer's desktop to a QA environment, to a staging, to production, it allows uh, uh, cloud native applications can easily move through that. So the features you see listed here are exposed in Wildfly Swarm through various fractions or functionality within Swarm itself. And we'll, I'll go through two of them today. 
Uh, there's a number of others that we won't get to because of uh, we don't have en enough time today, and you'll probably get bored watching uh, screens fly by after uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, so I mentioned MicroProfile. So Wildfly Swarm is a, an implementation of MicroProfile. So this is a set of specifications championed by a number of, of uh, influential uh, communities within the uh, Java ecosystem, including Red Hat, IBM, Pyara, Tommy Tribe, and et cetera. You can see the list there. Um, Swarm is our implementation of this specification. And this, again, targets Java microservice developers who might not need the complete set of specifications coming out of Java EE, or they might be using a, a legacy platform like WebLogic or WebSphere, and they kind of want to move off of that and get into a more micro, uh, smaller, uh, logically smaller implementation using a subset of what they know. So you can see the list of, of specifications that are included in the latest release of MicroProfile, which was version 1.3, which came out, uh, I believe, about a week ago. Um, it has uh, support for health checks, for example, or uh, CDI and fault tolerance. These specifications, uh, interestingly, some of them actually started in the Wildfly community and were, were, were uh, donated to the MicroProfile community as a specification. Um, obviously, that makes things easier for Wildfly Swarm, but in other cases, uh, specifications came from IBM and, and from the rest of the, the MicroProfile community members who are working on this. So great set, a very small set, um, targeted specifically at microservices, um, and it's very easy to use with Swarm and with any of the other implementations. Okay, so let's get on to the demo. So uh, the demo is based off of some source code on GitHub. You can see the uh, the URL, that, or not a URL, but it's on my GitHub uh, account. Um, so what it is, what we're going to, what I'm going to do is take an existing application, swarmify it, and then we're going to break it apart into microservices and show you how you can build some cloud native aspects into those microservices using Wildfly Swarm. And then we'll tie them all together. Essentially, what we'll be doing is what we call strangling the monolith. This is a pattern that was championed by Martin Fowler a number of years ago, where it allows um, your projects to slowly evolve over time into a more modular architecture without having to rewrite everything uh, from the ground up. OK, so let's get out of slide mode and head over to uh, my trusty uh, developer environment. So what I have here is a, a number of, of projects. And we're only going to touch a couple of them today. So the first one is this monolithic application. This is what I was talking about. This is a Java EE application. Um, it's typical Maven uh, uh, build file here. You can see I only have one dependency. Or actually, I have two dependencies. I have a dependency on Java EE itself uh, because I've built this application over a number of years, and I'm a Java EE expert. I also have a dependency on a database. So in this case, we're using an in-memory database um, for simplicity. So the first thing I want to do as a, as, a, as a Swarm evaluator is I want to start with Swarm. So what's the easiest way to do that? Well. I have a uh, the uh, Forge JBoss Forge project has an integration with my IDE, so I've installed it, and now I have a nice little uh, set of uh, menu items items that I can use to get started quickly. So the first one is called Setup. So I'm going to just click this, just go ahead and click Finish, and now my project has been swarmified. So you can see what it's done. Let me scroll up and uh, highlight exactly what it did here. So it added a, a new property to my um, project for the version of Wildfly Swarm that it's going to use. It added a plugin definition for the Wildfly Swarm plugin, which integrates with Maven, which I'm using. And then it also added a, a dependency, a set of dependencies in a BOM, a bill of materials, which brings in the Wildfly components. Um, as I mentioned, this is a Java EE project that was written you know, five years ago with Java EE. Um, I am not going to touch the source code at all. I'm simply going to uh, build and run it with Wildfly Swarm now that I've added these three very small components. So I'm going to open up a, uh, a menu over here, which gives me access to um, my, uh, my Maven targets. So I'm going to open up my project here. Um, Wildfly Swarm is a plugin, so it appears under the plugins directory. And then I'm just going to simply run it with Wildfly Swarm Run. So what this is going to do is package up the application um, into a runnable jar file and then run it using java-jar. So very simple. You can imagine how that would integrate with your existing build systems and existing CI CD pipelines uh, because it is a, a fat jar, something you would get just like you would get with Spring Boot or Drop Wizard. 
um, or uh, other projects that use the concept of a fat jar. So right now it's building. Um, you can see up here somewhere it did the auto detection. So out of the box, it auto detects. So it looked at my source code and looked for annotations or looked for speci specific files and decided which fractions it needed to import. So it imported a number of fractions that I never even specified simply by uh, auto detecting them. So it installed these fractions and it started up the project and it looks like it should be up and running now. So it's up and running, um, you can see here, and it's running locally. So if we go back to my browser and open a new tab, and go to localhost 8080. It should be hopefully up and running. And it's up and running. So here's my monolithic application. Didn't touch a single line of, of, of uh, source code. I simply wrapped it in a runnable jar file with Wildfly Swarm. I let it auto detect what it needed. It created the, the runnable jar file and then ran it. So I can do things here. This is a online shopping cart, as you can imagine, as you can see, actually. I can add things to my cart. I can remove things and I'm all happy and everything looks good. Okay, so that's pretty fun. Now let's move into the cloud native aspect of this. So it's still a monolith, uh, but now I want to move it into a, a cloud orchestration platform. In this case, we're going to be using OpenShift. Um, OpenShift is, is Red Hat's uh, container orchestration platform built on uh, Kubernetes. And so to deploy that, I'm going to use another plugin called Fabricate. So Fabricate has is an upstream project for building uh, microservices with Red Hat technologies and other technologies. It has a Maven plugin as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, turn on that plugin and then it should appear in the menu here. So it did. So here's my Fabricate Maven plugin. But before I deploy it, the first thing you do with cloud native applications is one of the first things you, you need to do, you should do is, is create a, um, a, a health check. Uh, this implements a health check pattern. It allows container orchestration platforms to discover whether your application is healthy or not, which is really important for avoiding downtime during an update or for detecting when something's gone wrong and um, and and, re and automatically you know healing the application, replacing the broken parts, and uh, bringing up a new version of the application. So I want to add a health check, and it just so happens that Wildfly Swarm and MicroProfile have a, that notion of a health check. Uh, so to use this in Wildfly Swarm, you need to add a new fraction. So I'm going to use my uh, my trusty uh, Swarm tool or my my trusty plugin here. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to stop this running process, and now I'm going to add this fraction that I need for my health check. So I'm going to click the magic button again, bring up this Swarm um, uh, command tool, and say add fraction. So I'm going to add, there's a number of fractions. There's almost 200 different fractions you can add to uh, to Swarm. The one I want is called Monitor. And this is a fraction that enables automatic health checking. So I'll click Finish here. And the only thing that it did just now is it added this dependency information to my build file. I could have done that manually. You probably will do that manually once you... Um, once you become more uh, familiar with with Swarm and the uh, fractions it has, but it added it for me here, and now I can go ahead and and deploy my application with the health check. I want to actually add some logic to my health check, so I'm going to quickly create a a new class in my monolith, um, which is going to implement my health check. So I'm going to create a new Java class. So I'll call it Infra Endpoint. This is an infrastructural endpoint. Yeah. It's going to be a JAXRS. Was there a question? I think that uh, we were having a little debate on the chat whether it was IntelliJ or Eclipse that you're using. Ah, it is IntelliJ idea. I lose. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's the the Forge plugin actually has a a, a uh, support for IntelliJ idea as well as Eclipse. So if you're using Eclipse, I think there's a NetBeans one as well, uh, but I'm using uh, IntelliJ here. So I'm going to create my uh, my my health check endpoint, which is going to be a RESTful endpoint. So I need to add a path here of infra, and I'm going to create a simple single uh, endpoint called check, and it's going to return a health status, which is another um, uh, class within Wildfly Swarm. So check, and it's it's going to be extremely simple. I'm just going to return healthy. Uh, which actually has value in itself because this won't actually work until the application is up and running. So um, we will just do this health uh, health status dot named. We'll call it main dot up. 
So I can add a bunch of logic up here to, uh, to you know, inspect the database or do something else before I return up. And I can return down if it's, if it's down, but I'm just going to go ahead and return up. So I need to annotate this with the, uh, with the RESTful endpoint annotations of get. So it's a get endpoint, meaning HTTP get. Uh, the path is going to be health. And then the magic health uh, annotation is a Wildfly Swarm annotation, which identifies this endpoint as a health check. Uh, you can have multiple of these in your application, and then Wildfly Swarm will aggregate them all and return kind of a, an aggregated value depending on all of those health checks. As long as they all pass, then Swarm will be happy with that. Okay, so I've implemented my, sing my simple health check. I've added my, um, my fraction for supporting health checks. So now I'm ready to deploy. So before I deploy, I'm going to go ahead and create a new project in, in OpenShift itself. So I'm going to log in to OpenShift. I have it running here locally. Um, I'm going to create a new project called Cool Store. So I have my new project here. And it's got nothing in it, obviously, because I just created it. So we'll just go ahead and now deploy it with uh, Fabricate. So Fabricate deploy of my monolith. So this plugin will package the application with Wildfly Swarm and then package that into a Docker uh, container image, builder image, ship that off to OpenShift, and then it will uh, go ahead and deploy that out to, um, to OpenShift. Let me make sure I'm logged in. I should be logged in to OpenShift. Yes, I am. OK, so. It's now uh, created the, the, what it's doing is actually uh, building it in OpenShift. So if I switch back to OpenShift, we can actually see that build in progress. So you can see it actually already finished. Uh, so the build finished, and now what, what uh, Fabricate will do is create the necessary Kubernetes objects to deploy that uh, and get that up and running in OpenShift, creating the uh, deployment config option object, the service object, and a route. So it looks like it finished now. So let's switch back to OpenShift. And you can see the application is now running. Um, it's actually on the way up. Um, while it's coming up, I can show you the health check. So within the OpenShift web console, you can look at the health checks. And you can see this path defined here, the slash health. This is the, you'll remember, the health check I defined was on infra slash health. And so this is the aggregated version of that, um, which will return true once it's uh, up and running here, hopefully. So it looks like it's up and running. So we can check out the logs here, make sure everything looks like it's OK. Oh, you know, I forgot one thing. So uh, when I when I turned on that health check uh, in the, you know, using the, the dependency, or Wildfly Swarm out of the box does auto detection, which you saw momentarily ago. Um, by adding a specific explicit uh, de declaration of this, um, of this uh, fraction, I Turn on that off implicitly because it thinks that I, I want I know what I'm doing and I'm I I uh, I, de I declare all the dependencies I need but I actually don't know what I'm doing so in order to turn the automatic uh, to the the, uh, the auto detection back on we need to configure this real quick so let me do that fraction detect mode force so I will go ahead and re undeploy that one and then redeploy it. Uh, so this, because I, again, because I declared the uh, monitor fraction, it turned off its automatic um, uh, auto detection of other fractions needed. So I need other fractions, obviously, because I haven't given it any other fractions to depend on. So I'll deploy that, undeploy that, and then redeploy it. And it should come back up, hopefully. Switch back over to OpenShift here. It looks like that one's gone. And my project is empty again, and then it will rebuild and then um, and then come back on. So you can see now it's it's doing its detection properly uh, because I forced it to auto detect uh, so that the application will come up completely. So wait for that. Wait for that to finish. Um, that should only take a couple of maybe 30 seconds or so. Uh, so what's going to happen is it's going to deploy that same exact monolith but to OpenShift with a health check. Uh, that's, we, we haven't talked about microservices yet, and that's the next topic. So what we're going to do is with our monolithic application, uh, which is a, 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 a retail store, 
there are different components to that, like a catalog for the number of of, um, of project products that you have for sale. There's also an inventory system to tell you how many of each project, how many how many of each product you have left. So we're going to split those out into individual microservices and then tie that into the monolith, so that we effectively start the process of strangling that monolith, where we're we can remove the the inventory and catalog components because they're now independently developed by our inventory team at our company and the catalog team at our company and are no longer part of the monolith. So that's what's going to happen here. So it looks like the new version is now finally up and running. So if I click this link here, I should get my monolith now and I see the monolith is running now on OpenShift. So it's all well and good. So again, this is the this UI is actually built from a number of different subsystems within the within the monolith, which we're now going to break out into microservices. So we're going to do two of them. One of them I've already done. <clears throat> the inventory service, uh, I've hired a bunch of JavaScript developers who love Node.js, and so they've implemented the inventory microservice as a Node.js application. So you can see it running here, or you can see the, the source code to it here. It's a very simple um, uh, microservice written in, in uh, Node.js and JavaScript. Uh, I've already deployed it. So if I switch back to OpenShift and go back to this uh, other project here called Service, you can see the inventory is already up and running. Um, if I curl it, which I could do, I can simply go like this and curl. I can do it like that. Um, so I curled a simple, I, I access this Node.js endpoint giving a product ID of this giant number. And it returned me the fact that I have 337 of these products left in Idaho. So it actually doesn't matter what number I choose here because my lazy developers uh, just return whatever I give them. So product 4545 also happens to have 337 in Idaho. Every single product is going to be in Idaho and have 337 copies of it. We're going to use that uh, to show you some, uh, some interesting things with circuit breaking. Okay, so that's my inventory service. It's up and running already. So we'll skip that one and move over to the catalog service. So this is the second and final microservice we're going to develop. This one is developed with Wildfly Swarm. Um, I've already created the project. Um, it has a RESTful endpoint for getting products. Um, um, and it, uh, it has a, a kind of a simple... Uh, uh, the way that it, it returns products is very simple. So it's actually a dumb, it's called dumb get quantity. And it calls into the inventory system and gets the inventory of each product and then adds that to the return value. So let's go ahead and deploy that um, out to OpenShift as well. So I will close that one down, open up the catalog microservice, plugins, fabricate, and I'll go ahead and deploy that out to OpenShift. So again, this is a, a simple catalog endpoint. It, it collects, it returns the, the products in the catalog with the inventory added to each component of the catalog by calling into this inventory service with very little error checking. In fact, there's no error checking um, because it's dumb and my developers are lazy and I guess I don't pay them enough. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's building, hopefully. It should um, take maybe 20 seconds or so to uh, build and deploy, and then we're going to test it out and see what happens. More importantly, we're going to see what happens when the inventory service is not working properly, um, and we should hopefully get a big, giant failure. Okay, so while that's deploying out, let's collapse this down, and we should, we'll wait, and the uh, catalog service should appear here momentarily once the build is complete. Um, just like we built uh, Wildfly Swarm Monolith, we're building the Wildfly Swarm microservice for the catalog service. So it looks like it's coming up now. So it's been deployed and it will start to boot up here. Again, I can watch the paint dry if I want. Um, you can see the the uh, Java or the OpenJDK container image is running my Wildfly Swarm microservice and it looks like it's coming up and it should be up momentarily. Okay, looks like it's ready to go here, hopefully. Yes, okay, so catalog service is up and running, so let's go ahead and test that real quick. So we'll, again, we'll curl that uh, here. Okay, so this, this my new catalog microservice returned a complete array of products. Each product has the same quantity of 337. Everything looks good. Um, my developers went off on holiday and all of a sudden, the inventory service has a problem. So I'm going to go ahead and shut off the inventory service. And let's see what happens if I try my product list again. 
So now you can see that it's sitting there waiting for a long time. And you can imagine what would happen if this was a real world product, a real world application like amazon.com. And you went here to buy a birthday gift for your best friend and you get this annoying timeout and you're going to head over to the competitor's website and purchase from there instead. So that's not good. That's unacceptable. I'm just actually going to time out after about 30 seconds. So what's happening here is obviously because I shut off the inventory service, the catalog service is unable to get the inventory and it then eventually times out. So let's fix that. So what we're going to do is we're going to use um, Hystrix. So Hystrix is, a, is an open source project from Netflix. Uh, it does circuit breaking and, and bulk heading and essentially allows you to do defensive programming. Uh, again, essentially adding an error check, right? If the service is down, then do something else. So I've already got the code in here, but before we can uncomment this code out, uh, we need to add the the um, the fraction, the, the Wildfly Swarm fraction. So I'll head over to my pom.xml. I can you can see I have a number of uh, dependencies already declared here. So I want to add a new dependency. Again, I'll just use the uh, swarm uh, uh, forge tool plugin in in uh, in my IDE here, hopefully. Yes, there it is. Uh, swarm add fraction. And now this one we're going to use Hystrix. So I'll scroll down to giant lists. Be nice to have autocomplete, but we don't. So I'll just click Hystrix finish. And what it will do is add that again to my palm.xml right here. So very simple. Again, you probably don't need a tool to do that for you, but um, it's fun and, and good eye candy for demos. Okay, so I've added that. So let me go back to my, uh, my dumb endpoint and change that to a smart endpoint. So I'm gonna uncomment my imports that I need just to speed things up. I've added some code for logging just to output some stuff to the log file so we can see what's happening. And now I'm going to comment out my dumb parallel stream and uncomment or bring to life my not uh, dumb endpoint. So I'm going to, and, and so this is going to essentially use a Hystrix command, which essentially wraps that call to the inventory service with a circuit breaker. It protects it. So if, if things are not operating correctly, then what will happen is this inventory will, will kick in. And Hystrix will manage the uh, checking of the, of the inventory service so that when it, when it comes back, it can start sending traffic to it. So it allows it to essentially recover. So the, the scenario here is you have a overloaded inventory service or a bug in the code and it, it causes it to fail and um, you need a backup uh, solution here. Our backup solution is a very simple hard-coded value. Uh, you would normally do something like check a cache or go to an alternate system or what you would have is multiple instances of the inventory system up and running so that if one fails it doesn't bring the whole system down and it can the load balancer can uh, rebalance and send traffic to the to the healthy versions of the inventory service. But for now, we're just going to use this simple uh, um, workaround here. So, OK, so I've got my code. I'm going to go ahead and deploy that out again. So I'm going to undeploy the old one um, and redeploy the new one. So that shouldn't take too long. And then we'll see what happens when uh, when the system is, is healthy and, uh, and unhealthy. OK, so de undeployed the old one. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy the new one now. Let me clean it first to make sure I get the make sure it recompiles and does all the new stuff that I want it to do. Okay, then I'll go ahead and deploy. If I'm in the right project here, yep, I am. Deploy, and then while that's going, I'm going to bring the inventory service back online just so we can demonstrate the uh, the failure scenario here. Okay, so it's coming back. Uh, the inventory service is coming back, and the new catalog service is being deployed at the moment. Actually, actually, I think it's building at the moment. So I'll switch back and just have a look at that. Yep, looks like it's still building. And now it's going to generate the necessary uh, build config Kubernetes objects to uh, to invoke the build. And then it's going to deploy that out to the, uh, to the, to the cluster. OK, so what should happen is once this gets deployed, we'll test it again. Obviously, with the inventory service running, everything will look good. We'll shut off the inventory service and then uh, get to uh, see what happens with the uh, with Hystrix and allowing Hystrix to manage the uh, the fallback when things are not healthy and to manage the uh, the revival of the of the inventory service once it comes back online. And then the last thing we'll do is tie all of this into our existing monolith, which we already have running. 
uh, to kind of demonstrate the uh, the final strangulation process, which is ex turns out to be extremely easy. Okay, so that looks like the new catalog service is, is deploying and it's coming up at the moment, should be up momentarily. So once that is uh, is ready to go here, let's just take a look at the log file, make sure everything looks okay. Looks like it's up and running. Go back here. We, yep, okay, so it looks like it's been deployed now. So I'll just collapse these two and let's go test our new uh, circuit breaker. So let's hit it again. Okay, everything looks good. Let me pipe that to a uh, pretty print thing. Looks like everything's good. I can just hit this as many times as I want. And it looks good. Everything's good. So now let's shut off the inventory service and see what happens. Go ahead and turn this guy off. Okay, now let's hit it again. So remember the last time we did this, it timed out after 30 seconds. So this one took there was a there was a brief hiccup there where it's it it the the call from the catalog to the inventory timed out or failed. Um and then Hystrix decided that the circuit needed to be opened because um, because the inventory system is, is unhealthy. So we get these negative ones here, and this is what we expect. If we were to tie this into the UI, which we'll do, you'll see the effect of this. So let's just bring the inventory service back online. And hopefully it should recover here. It's, right now it's probably still kind of de debating whether the, sur the, the service is back up and running again. So we'll just hit it a couple more times, and it should once it, um, once it decides that... Uh, that the service is healthy again, we should start getting 337 again, which indeed we do here. Okay, so that that is the uh, circuit breaker in action. In fact, if you look at the log file for the catalog, which is where the circuit breaker is defined, you can see there the circuit breaker is here. There's fallback, success, short circuited. Uh, this was at the time when the uh, when the when the inventory system was down, it was short circuiting, and then ultimately when it came back, it finally then returned success. Okay, so that's circuit breaker in action. All of the timeouts and thread pool sizes and all kinds of stuff that, uh, are tunable within Hystrix and through Wildfly Swarm and its fraction configuration. You can tune all of that stuff. I'm just using the defaults here uh, for demonstration purposes, but um, you would tune that based on the expected load and the, the, the size of your cluster and the number of, of um, instances of the services that you have up and running. So. Okay, so the final step here is we're going to tie this into the UI. And as, as I mentioned, it turns out to be extremely easy because we, so we have these two services, catalog and inventory, uh, but our, our monolith running over here has no idea that those exist. And we're still getting, you know, values like 736, 512, 256, because the, cat, the, the existing monolith has no clue that these services are out there. So in order to tie these in, we can actually use uh, OpenShift's uh, software-defined networking to do that. So this monolith, when I load this into my browser, it's making callbacks to itself to get the catalog and inventory information. I can inter intercept that and redirect it to my new microservices through software-defined networking. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's shift over to my new project here. What I want to do is create what we call a new route. Uh, it's a path-based route, which allows you to intercept specific calls to a specific host name and path and redirect those to different services running in my cluster. So I have uh, two routes here for the catalog and inventory. I'm going to create a third route called redirect. doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, the host name is going to be the host name of the monolith. The path I'm going to override is the slash services slash products path, which is the path that the monolith makes a call back to itself using that path. And I want to redirect that to my new catalog service, which in turn will call the new inventory service and then return those values back to the UI. So with this uh, route in place, now any call from my monolith, I can switch back to the monolith and um, experience that. So when it calls back into itself, it's actually being redirected to my new microservices and getting the values from my new microservice and the, the corresponding backend inventory system, which is controlled now by an independent team rather than the monolithic development team. Um, and so I can now essentially continue this process. I can take the price service, I can take the shopping cart service and turn those into microservices and then similarly strangle it 
strangle the monolith so that it uses these new services. And then ultimately I can turn off the, the monolith and I can, you know, fire all the developers that developed it uh, and then move, well, not, maybe not fire, but, you know, find different jobs for them um, and, um, and, and continue on with my independently developed and uh, autonomously, autonomously deployed microservice teams. Okay, so that's it for the demo. Um, so again, all of this code is on uh, on GitHub if you want to have a look. Um, and uh, there's actually a solution branch in there uh, that gives the solution with the code that I that I added to this project, so that you can get started quickly with the solution if you want to see exactly what I did. Okay, so switching back to the final slide here. Um, so that was the demo. Um, so last summary slide. So Wildfly is super awesome, uh, built on the upstream Wildfly Java EE community. Uh, essentially, it keeps Java EE developers in the game. So if you have experience with Java EE and you want to continue using that in a microservice world, in a new modular cloud native world, Wildfly Swarm is a great option for you. Uh, because it provides that path forward um, it also implements the uh, standards like microprofile and which has a huge community behind it and a lot of momentum and we see great things coming uh, forward with wildfly swarm okay so that's it uh, so i'll sh i'll check out if we have any questions um, let's see looks like yeah fonts keep getting smaller yeah that was the, the disappearing fonts was the thing but i didn't want to interrupt you <laughs> such a good flow um, you mentioned the GitHub repo. Can you pop over there in your browser and just show so that shows up to um, where all the code is for this demo? That would be a, a good thing to have in here. Uh, um, GitHub. And Wildfly's been around for a while, so I suspect that a number of people um, on this call are already Wildfly people. Um, so. Um, yes. Can remember if it was Wildfly Swarm examples or Roar examples. So there's the URL. Um, so I hit it on my browser here. You can see it. So actually, I've I used this code for a couple of other things. We have a Vertex microservice and a Spring Boot microservice, which we do a similar uh, process for. So you can see the code in there as well. But here's the monolithic code, um, which you can deploy to uh, to any uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes uh, using. Fabric 8, here's the Node.js inventory and the Wildfly Swarm catalog that we used in the demo. So Perfect. that's all there. Well, I, I think you did a pretty awesome job um, with, the, with the demo, even with the fonts shrinking, but um, I think <laughs> we can always expand our screens and see that. Um, and there aren't any questions in the chat that I see. I'm giving people a couple of minutes to, to ask if you can also now pop back into your thank you um, and slide, then I think we are almost to the end of our hour, and we will probably have more Roar um, talks coming up in the future, um, so stay tuned for that, and um, I want to respect everybody's time, and, and thank you very much, James, for another awesome um, presentation. Um, Great. Well, thanks for having me, Diane. It was fun. Yeah, it's always, always is. You're always um, very entertaining and, and interesting content so um, I'm very appreciative it's like having a private tutorial every single time so yeah so that that, that web page there developers.redhat.com slash roar you can get a lot more information about swarm and roar in general um, mm -hmm. and details on what what the components are and how they're supported from Red Hat cool all right well um, we look forward to more and um, hearing more from if people are running um, wildfly um, swarm um, app, or building applications with that in roar and want to talk about their use cases, please let me know and um, I'll give you the podium because we'd love to hear from you. All right, thanks very much. Okay, bye-bye.